so now we've uh, come on to a uh, very topical subject, the millennials and socialism. Uh, and I suppose you would all count as being millennials, or is it post-millennials now? I lose track of these generations. Uh, but the, the, you've no doubt heard all the stories about how the idea of socialism, which you may have thought was uh, buried with a stake to its heart and a necklace of garlic around it, uh, has suddenly shown signs of life again from the Hammer House of Horrors. Uh, so we've got a panel here to talk about this, and I'm going to ask Joseph Sternberg to, my here to kick us off. So uh, they asked us to talk for only one or two minutes. I'm going to do my best to stick to that, although I can't make any promises. Um, and I also am fortunate to be going first because that means that I can set the agenda without having to worry about whether I'm going to overlap with uh, anyone else on the panel. Um, it, the one contribution I want to make to start us off here is to understand if we're going to talk about why is it the uh, millennials, including you know, people like me, because I was born in 82, so I am one, uh, even though I'm pushing 40. Uh, you know, if you're going to talk about why is it that millennials are turning to socialism, I think that it's helpful to start by thinking about what is it that millennials are turning away from. Uh, and this was the big issue that I started thinking about as I sat down last year to try to dig into what has been going on uh, with generational economics and politics in the US, uh, especially over the past decade. And the conclusion I reached is that although we grew up in a period when you had bruising political battles between the left and the right, either between the Tories and Labour here, uh, between Democrats and Republicans in the US, once you actually sit down and think about what the boomers were doing when they were in power uh, starting in the 90s, you realize that they were often traveling in a very narrow policy lane. The way I came to think about this narrow lane is that what they were trying to do was harness the productive power of the market. Uh, you know, all of the lessons that they had learned in the Reagan and Thatcher era about how you do need a functioning market economy. Uh, but graft onto that what the boomers perceived as the protective power of the state. So you end up with this economic system where uh, even though there is a strong market element to it, there's also a very strong state element to it. Uh, you know, the biggest and worst example of this in the US was the housing market before the financial crisis, which was a boomer attempt to create an ownership society, which sounded very markety, but to do it through very intensive government intervention and steering. Well, what has happened for millennials is that that system is breaking down. You know, we see this in the 2008 financial crisis and the uh, slow growth aftermath, particularly in the US, where we had a much longer period than Britain did of uh, slow economic growth and very high unemployment. Uh, you, know, you can see as a millennial who has graduated into this economy that that narrow policy lane wasn't working and we're trying to get out of it. And now I think that the reason that a lot of millennials are getting out of the lane, that narrow policy lane by veering to the left in a socialist direction is because those are the politicians who are currently happy to teach us how to get out of that lane. You know, in America, I grew up in Vermont. That was Bernie Sanders' country. He was my congressman in the 90s when I was a teenager, whether I liked it or not. And uh, you know, the one thing that you could say about him was that he was never invested in that narrow lane. He was always standing outside on the left, uh, opposing that boomer policy consensus that we now see has created so many distortions in our economy. I think that's, you know, Jeremy Corbyn has done the same thing where he was never bound up in sort of the, the, the whole new labor phenomenon. He was always very much outside of Britain's narrow lane. So you can understand why uh, if millennials feel like that narrow policy making lane has broken down for us in key ways, you know, we are prepared to follow politicians who are leading us out of it. And the problem is that right now those politicians are on the left. On the right uh, in America, we are terminally distracted by Donald Trump, who is nothing if not a boomer, who is very invested in the old boomer policy making method. Uh, here, I think that you have a lot of uh, older conservatives who are perhaps very heavily invested in uh, Brexit and the political questions that that raises, which I think is pulling attention away from all of the other ways that you could be offering a free market path out of this narrow lane. So I think that you know, I'm going to wrap up just having planted that seed of a thought there, this issue that what I think really is happening isn't so much that uh, millennials are all inherently socialist, 
It's that we are all inherently skeptical of this very narrow path that our parents were following when they were in power. And I think that if you want millennials not to be socialist, uh, parties in the political right, the free market right, are going to have to come up with a compelling path out of that narrow lane that aligns with our principles, instead of just leaving it up to people in the socialist left to give us a path out of that lane. Okay. Your next question. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, I completely agree with Joseph that a lot of current economic policies are heavily biased against the younger generations, especially the housing market. That's the most extreme example. It's even worse here than in the US. Uh, but also the composition of public spending. So uh, I can totally see why millennials, or now increasingly members of Generation Z, are not particularly happy about the status quo. I share that. What I find more surprising is that so many of them seem to see socialism as a solution to uh, the problems that they're facing. Because there is an old, well-known logical fallacy. I don't know whether it has a, a name, but it goes, we need to do something, this is something, therefore we need to do this. And I get the impression that millennial socialism is basically a version of this logical fallacy. It, it goes, we need something that's different from the status quo, socialism is different from the status quo, therefore we need socialism. Doesn't follow at all, but that seems to be the, the logic that uh, a lot of uh, young people are, uh, are following. There was earlier this year uh, a cover story in The Economist, which had the title, The Rise of Millennial Socialism. And uh, in the same week, I think, the New Statesman magazine also had a cover story on that subject, almost identical title. As you would expect, The Economist and The New Statesman disagreed in their assessment of that phenomenon. The Economist was mostly skeptical. The New Statesman was very supportive of it. But they completely agreed on one thing, which was that millennial socialism was a real thing. It was indeed a phenomenon. It was happening. And that is borne out by a lot of the survey, uh, the, the survey evidence on this. Just one example. Last year, there was a, a large survey in which two out of five people under the age of 35 agreed with the following statement. Communism could have worked if it had been better implemented. So the old cliche, real communism has never been tried, even though it is a cliche, it is also a widely held view. And by the way, this is clearly not about a Nordic type social democracy being like Sweden or, or in any of that stuff. It was, I know that of course the word socialism is a bit am, am, ambiguous, but in this case they asked it about communism, uh, which removes a lot of that ambiguity and, um, well, that, that word itself, communism, has made a comeback. It's now often used as a fashion statement. I mean, don't get me started on uh, fully automated luxury communism and uh, on the, those T-shirts, uh, I'm literally a communist. Uh, it does show that this, this, is, this has nothing to do with Sweden or, or Denmark. This is proper socialism that's making a comeback. So what should those of us who hold the unfashionable view that maybe markets aren't so bad, uh, what, what should we do about this? Uh, well, it's two things. The first one was mentioned by Joseph, agree with that, of course. We have to show that there are uh, market-compatible solutions to the, the real problems that millennials are facing, and especially the housing market is or should be a low-hanging fruit here. That's a policy area that's crying out for free market reforms. Should be fairly easy for, uh, for people on the pro-market side to, um, to own that subject. But I think that's not enough. We also do need to make a negative case against socialism, because if you compare socialism as an abstract ideal to real-world capitalism, then uh, capitalism will always come up short. So what, what we need to show in particular is uh, the following. Millennial socialism is not a nostalgia for the Soviet Union or the old Eastern Bloc. It is the idea that socialism could be completely different, that it could be democratic, empowering, non-hierarchical and all that. What, what we need to emphasize is that this is not a new idea. That has always been the idea of socialism. That's what socialists have always said throughout the ages. So what millennial socialism really is, it's, it's not a new form of socialism, uh, nothing of that kind. It is just the old socialism repackaged. It's socialism repackaged as cool and trendy, but it is still the old socialism and it's going to turn out the same way if it ever gets implemented. Thank you.
Yes, Christian, I agree with everything, and I can recommend his book to every one of you. It's Socialism, the Failed Idea That Never Dies. It's a great book. And um, if you ask me, what is the best argument for capitalism? My answer is the best argument for capitalism is that it is the best system to fight against poverty. And before capitalism, 200 years ago, 90% of the global, uh, of the global uh, population was living in extreme poverty. Today, that figure has fallen to only 10%. And what is particularly interesting, that half of this decline has happened over the last 35 years. And maybe some of you have heard about the French, the left-wing French economist Thomas Piketty with his book, The Capital in the 21st Century. And if he looks back over the last 35 years, all he sees is increasing inequality. You, you, every one of you have heard about it, the gap between the poor and the rich. If I look back, when I look back over the same 35 years, I see a dramatic decrease in poverty. And whenever anyone asks what triggered this incredible turnaround in the fight against global poverty, I have a simple answer. The death of Mao Zedong in September 1976. Because as late as the end of the 50s, 45 million people died as a result of Mao's Great Leap Forward experiment in China. And I speak on this subject all over the world. And whenever I ask people, young people, whether you have heard about this biggest socialist experiment in history where so many people died, and I ask everyone, who heard about this at school or in university, I ask young people. Almost no one raises his hand. Or maybe I can ask you, who has heard in school about this greatest socialist experiment in history, the so-called Great Leap Forward with these 45 million people uh, who were killed in China? Please raise up your hands. OK, that's good. It's better than in other countries. So I, I want that everyone knows about this. And now what is important for me, at no other point in history have so many people escaped bitter poverty in such a short time than in China. According to official World Bank figures, the percentage of extremely poor people in China in 1981 stood at 88%. Today, less than 1% of Chinese population is living in extreme poverty. In this period, the number of poor people in China fell from 900 million to less than 10 million. And perhaps it is surprising for some of you to take the example of China to prove that capitalism is a great system. Is China even a capitalist country? Doesn't the state play a huge role in all areas of life in China? Sure, it does, of course. China is far from being a purely capitalist country, but the, and the state still exercises far too much control. But all the progress in China over the past 40 years is only due to the fact that the Chinese have step by step introduced principles of free market and private property ownership. That means more capitalism. I've been in China and uh, I spoke with a leading Chinese economist, free market economist, Zhang Wang, and he always repeated that you have to understand that China's economic miracle did not happen because of the state, but in spite of the state. And capitalism is not the problem, it's a solution, especially when it comes to the fight against hunger and poverty. Maybe some of you know this uh, index of economic freedom from the Heritage Foundation, you can get it every year, which ranks every country in the world to the measure of progress in economic freedom. And year after year, the ranking proves that no one goes hungry in the countries with the greatest economic freedom. In stark contrast, economic repression only ever leads to hunger and poverty, as we have seen again in Venezuela, where more than 10% of the population have already fled to escape starvation under the socialist regime. And 
to tell you one thing in the end, to be honest. I believe, I, I as a person, I made a lot of money as an entrepreneur, a self-made entrepreneur, and I belong to the strong people, so you may say it's not surprising that he speaks pro-capitalism. But I think capitalism is not so important for the strong people, because the strong people, they come everywhere in the world around, in every system, even in a dictatorship. They don't need it, you know? I'm strong, you see it here, my Russell, in every case. Yes, I am, and I'm rich, I don't need capitalism. I come around in every system. But for the poor people in the world, capitalism is so important, and this is the message I want to send out to you today. Thank you. I'm going to begin by making a rather shocking admission. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lowe. I work for the world's greatest free market think tank. That's the IEA, if you haven't already realized today. And I have some sympathy for socialism. Now, let me clarify. I don't mean I'm a socialist. I don't mean I want socialism imposed on me or you or anyone else. And I don't mean that I'm sympathetic to state ownership of the means of production or any of the central planning atrocities of the 20th century, which led to the, un led to the avoidable and tragic deaths of millions. Rather. I mean that socialism is simply not reducible to those atrocities. To claim so, as ever, is to give far too much power, one of those nice leftist concepts, to Karl Marx, or largely to those who have acted in his name. Now, Karl Marx famously took his ideas from three sources, the utopian French socialists, the sensible British political economists, and the crazy German philosophers. Lenin pointed this out, although I think he possibly might have used different adjectives. Well, those French socialists predated Marx, as did many other people throughout the history of mankind, in believing in certain ideals, which we can find at the heart of what has become known as socialism. Again, these ideals are simply not reducible to the economic disasters of central planning or state ownership. Rather, socialism is a set of ethical ideals, which the Marxist-Leninist obsession with economic determinism distracts us from. Now, my favorite socialist writer, probably my only socialist writer I like, although I have a lot of time for reading Marx, but my favorite socialist writer, the great 20th century political philosopher G.A. Cohen, uses the example of the kind of cooperative behavior that arises happily and efficiently on a camping trip to try to pin these ethical ideals down. In his final, very, very short book, Why Not Socialism? It's got a question mark at the end of that, which is quite important. So the book starts in characteristically readable fashion. You and I and a bunch of other people go on a camping trip. He then talks of equality, reciprocity, community, virtue, and individual flourishing. Now, Cohen doesn't manage to persuade me to socialism. Indeed, his discussion of the deep problems of its feasibility is really very, very strikingly strong. Cohen says that socialism suffers from a perhaps insoluble design problem, the problem that we do not know how to design the machinery that would make it run. And moreover, while his writings do reassure me that socialism is not necessarily inimical, to concerns about individual freedom or even democracy in principle. I'm afraid I just remain afraid that any socialist system would insufficiently respect the natural political rights I'm so strongly committed to. But, so, but Cohen does help me to understand socialism's human appeal, an ethical appeal to justice and fundamental equality, and wanting to recognize those who are less fortunate than us simply through the luck of the draw. So central planning atrocities are appealing to few people today or ever. I don't know, there's probably many. I don't think there's probably any person in the history of time who's been like, yeah, I'm going to convince you to my way of thinking by bringing about horrific central planning atrocities, which again, kill millions of people. So I think those of us who fear socialist, socialism's economic or political consequences give it just far too easy a pass by reducing it to the murderous followers of Marx. Thanks. Thanks.